In March 2023, 58-year-old Leticia Martinez offered her spare ticket to a Mariners game to a fellow fan, whom she had only met a few weeks earlier. The two attended the game together. They chatted in the stands. They smiled. They took a selfie. Leticia sent the photo to a friend that night. She was enjoying a well-deserved night off. Beginning the next morning, communication to Leticia's phone became bizarre. Then abruptly, the connection was lost altogether. Friends and family soon learned that the single mother did not make it home from the baseball game. What had become of her after leaving the stadium? And who was the strange man smiling next to her in her last photograph? Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome back to Just Thought Lounge. Today we're taking a look at a case that shook Seattle and the country in the spring of 2023. Leticia Martinez Cosman was known as an exceptionally giving person. So when she offered a baseball ticket to a complete stranger, no one who knew her was surprised. But what happened next would shock everyone. Let's take a look. As a single mother and the primary caregiver to an adult son with special needs, Leticia Martinez Cosman rarely took any time to herself. On the evening of March 31, 2023, the diehard Seattle Mariners fan was grateful for tickets to that night's game. They were set to play the Cleveland Guardians, and Leticia was set for a night out. Always the sort of person to share in her good fortune, Leticia had arranged to give a ticket to a fellow fan, a younger man whom she had met at a local Costco superstore just a few weeks earlier. At the store food court, the two had struck up a conversation. They bonded over their mutual love of baseball, and Leticia offered to take him to a game. On game night, things wrapped up around 10.30 p.m., with the Guardians taking the win 9-4. This loss, however, was not to be the low point of the evening. The couple were caught on camera leaving the T-Mobile Stadium together. Leticia had driven her own car, a Honda CRV. There was, at that time, no signs of trouble, no reasons for concern. But it was the last time the 58-year-old single mother would be seen alive. Leticia grew up in Encinitas, California, surrounded by a very tight-knit family, including brother Ricardo. In the late 1990s, pregnant with her son Patrick, Leticia and her then-husband, Craig Cosman, relocated to Seattle, Washington to settle long-term and raise their son. When her marriage ended, Leticia became the primary caregiver for young Patrick. Patrick had been diagnosed with autism, Asperger's, and OCD. According to family, he required 24-7 care. Leticia, at times, carried two jobs to keep them afloat. She was also an entrepreneur, opening the Cafe Rosella in the White Center, where she hosted community events in support of cultural diversity, live music, and local AA meetings. As a staple of the community, and in keeping with her Buddhist faith, Leticia was well known as a kind and generous person. In spring 2023, this innocence led her to befriend a fellow Mariners fan at the local Costco. She met him like two weeks before and she'd struck up a conversation with this guy and they exchanged numbers. He didn't have money for lunch and she bought him a hot dog at Costco. The day following the ball game, Saturday, April 1st, friends began receiving text messages from Leticia. Or rather, they received strange messages from Leticia's phone. One message said that she was leaving the game the night before and that she, quote, had run into an old boyfriend and ended up hanging out with him all night. Another message confirming that she was feeling okay 
said that she was fine and that she was babysitting. This was followed by another message to the person that she was, in fact, meant to babysit for, canceling those plans. An old work colleague had sent a message to Leticia on the day of the baseball game. He later checked his messenger to see if she ever got his message. Somebody was viewing her instant messenger messages at two in the morning the night that she disappeared. Messages sent around this time also went to her brother. Ricardo had stated only that these messages were odd and uncharacteristic of Leticia. So he started calling her. Multiple calls throughout that day went unanswered. Eventually, the calls stopped ringing through at all and went straight to voicemail. Leticia's device had been powered off. In the early morning hours of Sunday, April 2nd, Leticia's son Patrick, 24 years old, was at home asleep in his bedroom. He was alone. His mother had not returned from the baseball game. At roughly 2 a.m., he was awoken by the sound of knocking on his bedroom door. Someone was already inside the house. A man entered his room. Patrick, an adult with an intellectual disability, believed that the man could have been one of his neighbors. The stranger told him that his mother had been injured and that he had come to the house to collect Patrick to go and see her at the hospital. Patrick went with the man to the SUV that he was driving. He got into the vehicle. Then the two drove around Seattle for an unknown length of time, but it's thought to be likely around two hours. At one point, they stopped so that the man could buy some water. Then they continued on. At some point during their ride, the man parked the car and moved into the back seat. From there, he tried to put a bag over the younger man's head. He also tried at one point to use his forearm to apply pressure against Patrick. Patrick is reported to be over six feet tall and 200 pounds. In good physical shape, he was able to overpower his attacker. He struck the horn of the SUV several times, waking up residents in the neighborhood of Renton, where they found themselves parked. Someone was honking and honking like crazy. After a struggle in which Patrick bit his attacker on the hands, the man drove off. He left Patrick on the side of the road. Calls to 911 began streaming in. Neighbors heard the honking outside and others could see Patrick alone in the trees, the young man uncertain of what to do next. He's been standing outside, uh, like in the bushes, and I've been, we've been watching him through the window, and he kept pacing, pacing back and forth. Every time he sees a car coming his way, he hides in the bushes. Once safely away from his attacker, Patrick was able to place a call to 911. I'm calling because my mother somehow knows what's going on. I can't call her, and I don't know where I'm at, and I, I, I don't know really who to trust. I just like to talk to a police. What city are you in? Hello? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm scared. Okay, what's going on? Uh, some guy. I was in a car with some guy. And I thought he was going to kidnap me. Patrick was unable to identify the man that had kidnapped and attacked him, but he was able to offer a description. He said the man was white, had facial hair and glasses. And he recalled other details. He said that his attacker told him that he was doing this for Patrick's mother. The stranger attempted to kill him for the sake of Leticia, or so the attacker had claimed. Patrick went straight to his uncle's home after the attack. Ricardo then formally reported Leticia missing. At 6.49 a.m. on Sunday, April 2nd, only two hours after Patrick placed his call to 911, the Seattle Fire Department responded to a vehicle fire on the side of the road near Lewis Park and North Beacon Hill in Seattle. Responders extinguished the fire and determined that the vehicle appeared to have been intentionally set ablaze with the use of accelerants. 
Investigators later identified the vehicle as Leticia's Honda CRV, the same vehicle that she had driven to T-Mobile Stadium two days before. There had been no one inside the vehicle. Uh, Seattle Police uh, have recovered a vehicle. Um, uh, as they are again following whatever leads come from that vehicle, whatever evidence uh, uh, comes out of the recovery of that vehicle. Um, so uh, the public uh, does, uh, there is no information that they should be looking for a, another vehicle in relation to this investigation. The image of Leticia with the stranger from the baseball game was given to police by the friend she had sent it to. The photo was circulated all over the city. It was hoped that someone would be able to identify this man. It had not been confirmed that Patrick's kidnapper was the same person who had been at last seen with his mother, but it certainly seemed likely. These suspicions were later confirmed when Seattle police obtained personal surveillance video from a home across the street from Leticia's. The footage showed the same man from the Mariners game approaching the front door of her house at midnight, hours before Patrick was awoken. That was not the only footage to capture the stranger lurking around homes in the night. Three days before Leticia went missing, near the Genesee neighborhood in Seattle, an unknown man was caught entering the backyard of a home around midnight and then hastily exiting upon seeing the cameras. One hour later, he returned and tried to enter the same home through the back door, but found it locked. He then disabled security cameras, all but one it seems, and cut the Comcast cable wires. He broke into the yard shed and stole a leaf blower and an outdoor clock. The retained footage was posted on the West Seattle blog. It was titled, The Genesee Hill Prowler. From there, the video was further shared and circulated around the community. It didn't take long for local residents to make the connection. The Genesee Prowler was Leticia Martinez's likely abductor. The picture looked the same. So I went back and sent the link to my wife from the one uh, to the other and said, hey, I think it's the same guy. That the suspect in Leticia's missing persons case, her son's abductor, and the neighborhood prowler was the same person was becoming clear. With this in mind, it seemed most likely that the man would keep a low profile, or at the very least, stop wearing the same Mariner shirt in public. But on April 3rd, at the same Costco location where Leticia had met her new friend, the Mariner's man was seen lifting the top of a display cabinet full of jewelry, grabbing handfuls of items, and taking off through the parking lot. He escaped from the scene with $10,000 in jewelry. However, security was able to record the license plate of the 1999 Audi that the man had it driven off in. It was registered to 46-year-old Brett Michael Gitchell. The next day, Brett Gitchell went to another Costco. There, he was promptly identified by an employee for wearing the same clothes and matching the description as a suspect in the jewelry theft the day before. An off-duty Kings County deputy, who happened to be at the store shopping at that time, was informed that the alleged burglar was in the store. The deputy made the arrest. When police brought Brett Gitchell in for questioning, they found that he had numerous cuts and bruises, notably on his hands. Police took his clothes for processing and noticed that he appeared to have blood on the inside of his right shoe. While the processing was underway, officers watched as Brett slid the Seattle Mariner's entry wristband that he had been wearing off of his wrist and into his pocket, an apparent attempt to conceal it. Investigators were keen to discuss the location of Leticia Martinez with Brett. By that time, she had been missing for three full days. But when they asked Brett about Leticia and showed him a picture of her, he claimed to have never met her. When they asked him whether he had attended a Mariners game that season, he told them no. Brett then claimed the wristband, now in his pocket, was from a friend. Then he was presented with the photo of himself and Leticia together from the Friday night game. At that point, Brett Gitchell asked, for a lawyer. Uh, we, 
We also want to update that the Seattle police uh, detectives, uh, along with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, uh, has developed probable cause to arrest a uh, 46-year-old male suspect for the investigation of murder, uh, kidnapping, uh, theft, and assault. Brett was no stranger to Seattle law enforcement. He had issues on and off for over 20 years. At one time, he was employed as a bus driver for a nonprofit in a nearby neighborhood, but seems to have lost this employment. His Facebook page states that he had been a student studying at Central Washington University since the spring of 2022. There is no sign on his social media of a violent or unstable life. But Brett had shown the signs of being a dangerous individual for years. He has a number of protection orders against him in King County, including one from his own mother. The order was filed in 2017, claiming that her son threatened her life and said he would bash her head in. Her written statement said, I am too afraid to do anything about him. I am afraid he will kill me. I can't take it anymore. A similar protective order had been filed by an ex-girlfriend of his in 1997, who again stated a fear for her life. Beginning in 2022, Brett's behavior seemed to escalate, and he was alleged to have made further threats. In a report from January 2023, Brett's landlord told police that she had been having problems with him for months. She shared with police that she was worried he would actually burn the apartment down. On December 12, 2022, a staff member at Central Washington University contacted Ellensburg police and stated Brett had been in contact with the school and was in Alexandria, Virginia. He apparently claimed to CWU staff that he had contracted a disease from pool equipment that infected him with nanotechnology and that he was currently looking for the CIA headquarters. Ellensburg police then reported that the Secret Service reached out and requested more information on Brett Gitchell. He did not appear in court for his first scheduled appearance. Then he refused to appear in court for the second day in a row for the bond hearing. He was given a $5 million bond and remained in Kings County Jail. With Leticia still missing and Brett not talking, the charges initially focused on the attack on Patrick. The prosecution laid out a thorough case. Never met uh, Patrick before, and now he's trying to strangle him. Uh, and one with a, something he puts over his head, which is an unknown material that uh, unfortunately Mr. Cosmo couldn't describe exactly what that was, but also with his forearm on his throat. And only after being bitten and injured was he unable to overcome Patrick uh, which allowed him then to get out of the vehicle and call 911. A warrant to obtain Brett Gitchell's phone data was key to piecing much of the case together. Phone records determined that Brett was in the area at the time that Patrick was attacked. And then at 6 a.m. that same morning, after Patrick had been left stranded, Brett was at a Shell gas station one mile from the location where Leticia's Honda was set on fire. At the station, Brett purchased a gas canister and a lighter. In a second transaction, he filled the canister with fuel at the pump. Prosecutor Chris Anderson also stated that Brett's phone had pinged where Leticia's car was burned. But that's not all. In the continued efforts to locate Leticia, the phone records offered a potential lead. They showed that on that Sunday, Brett had traveled miles from Ellensburg where he used to live, into a dense, mountainous region, had stayed for a short period of time, and then drove back to Seattle. He was in the location where uh, Miss Martinez Cosman's vehicle was burned. Uh, historical data also shows him driving to a remote, mountainous region of King County on April 1st. During questioning, when asked about his activities within the last week, Brett Gitchell told officers that he had gone to Ellensburg on April 2nd, two days after the ball game. But other than that, he had been in the Seattle area. His phone data told a different story. 
15 hours after Leticia had been last seen alive, Brett Gitchell was in a remote region on the Snoqualmie Pass. His phone pinged in two areas. 12 hours after returning, he was found on camera approaching Leticia's front door and kidnapping her son. Searches in the region began immediately, though the area is large and the teams needed to fight both weather and terrain. Then on April 11th, in a wooded area near the far west end of South 192nd Street on the north side of Renton, police recovered a body. The King County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed they had found Leticia Martinez Cosman. She had been face down and partially submerged in a small creek running alongside the road. The area was only one and a half miles from where Patrick had been rescued on the roadside. The similarities between Patrick's attack and Leticia's murder did not end there. Investigators believed that they had both been lured into the car with lies. Then, a few days after she was found, the autopsy revealed that Leticia had been strangled to death. Unlike her son, she had been unable to fight off the killer. I got the, um, the news, I, I kind of felt more, um, more at peace a little bit because we had found her. A charge of second-degree murder was added to the list of those pending against Brett Kitchell. He pleaded not guilty to murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, and gun and theft charges. This came as a bit of a shock, but also disappointment to Leticia's friends and family. It was surprising that with so much evidence of his guilt, that Brett chose to fight the charges. I was just kind of sickened, and um, I was disgusted to hear a plea of not guilty. When there is so much evidence uh, against a person for homicide, you know, there's obviously a lot of pressure to plead guilty. It was so nice that she invited him to a game. And um, so he went to the game with her and, and she was never seen again. Brett finally made an appearance in court in response to the murder charge, though cameras were not allowed to capture his face. A trial date has been set and already pushed back. It is unclear when this case will go to trial, if it eventually does. In addition to the murder charges, prosecutors have charged Brett Gitchell as the Genesee Prowler. These minor charges include unlawful access and stealing of items from the garden shed in late March. He is also facing prison time for the Costco burglary. Leticia's brother Ricardo has started a GoFundMe to support the family. The funds are to cover laying Leticia to rest, as well as the ongoing care of Patrick, who will need support for the rest of his life. Since his mother's death, Patrick has moved to Texas to live with his father. That was the chilling case of Brett Michael Gitchell in the murder of Leticia Martinez Cosman. Thanks again for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.